everyone, welcome to the second <coughs> session um, on capitalism and crisis. Um, James is going to speak for about 20 minutes and then there's going to be plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, James is a member of Comes Fire, a member of the Steering Committee, and. Okay, so of course, yeah, so okay. Okay. Anyway, moving on. So I want to talk about the uh, Communist Manifesto and uh, its relationship to, to Marx's economic uh, thought, which is. Uh, there's two things that tend to happen with this, particularly in relation to the manifesto and actually to Marx's work in general. Um, one of them is, and both of these things are kind of sympathetic to Marx, but one of them is probably exemplified by Francis Wheaton's biography of Marx, which came actually a while ago, that's probably about 2000, 2001, it's been 15 years, horribly. Um, so it's a while ago, it's a big popular book, and I think it still sells well, and probably a few people have read it, and it's, it's a decent read. Mm -hmm. And it basically presents Marx as it's really, as four BBC actually did a um, whole book of, book of the fortnight or something right, like that. Right. Even the BBC yeah. recommends it. So it's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's, it's a good read. And Francis Wayne writes well, and he is actually sympathetic to Marx, which, which sort of helps in, in this case. But it's um, it's got this it's got this issue where it basically kind of presents Marx as kind of jolly old chap, you know, sort of Victorian gent who's a bit rapscallion, really. He's kind of I mean, it's like drinking bloody angles and then. You know, kind of escapades around, well, just around here actually, that sort of thing. And, and one of the things that Francis is quite keen to drum home is, uh, you know, the, the, the philosophy is interesting, the history is interesting, the economics is complete rubbish, right? Just ignore it, right? It's, it's nonsense, it's just silly, it's just completely uh, something to be put to one side. And everything else in Marx is quite fun uh, and interesting and entertaining, it's a literary exercise, but the economics is basically just hokum. Uh, and he describes capital. Uh, as somebody mentioned this in the last session, uh, it describes capital as being like a gothic novel. You know, there's this big sort of baroque construction with monsters and demons and god knows what else. Now, to be honest with you, this frankly suggests somebody hasn't really read capital too closely. Like, you can read a bit of it and think that, but by the time you're <laughs> immersed in volume two and the endless tables and permutations and reproduction schemes and the rest of it, it's a bit crap novel if you ever try it. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a gothic novel. That's one part that you do with Marx. It's basically go, here's his theory of history, here's his theory of society and philosophy, and here's the economic sequence, and just park it over here uh, and ignore it. And he separate two things, and he said, that's not so good. The other one is, is something that's a bit more academic, it's also academic exercise, which is to, um, to sort of take Marx and then go, right, you've got the Communist Manifesto, and you've got his kind of early works, things like Thesis and Feuerbach and uh, German ideology and a few other things like this. And then you've got Capital, which is like his mature work, his later stuff. It's like when he really sat down and probably thought about everything. This is him writing in a serious way. And the other stuff is a bit too, you know, it's a bit kind of philosophical. It's a bit sort of airy-fairy. I mean, Althusser, Louis Althusser, a French philosopher, pushes it further than anybody else. Actually, it includes Communist kind of Manifesto in his later work, but it says it's this epistemological break. There's the early Marx, there's later Marx, and totally separate things. Right, and the economics is totally separate, this is serious science, and the other stuff is kind of Hegelian philosophy and it's literary, and you can ignore it. And what, what I want to say briefly in this is that both of these approaches are wrong. Right? For, you can't really approach Marx's economics without also thinking about his politics and what he says really in the Communist Manifesto and the project he sticks to uh, throughout his life as detailed uh, in the manifesto that it doesn't make much sense to talk about Marx's economics without that. And that although the kind of the economics of the manifesto itself is limited, there's like actually the, the dynamic that he describes it as something that he develops later on as his theoretical system uh, develops, as he develops his writing, as he writes capital and the Grundrisse and the theories of surplus value and all this sort of later, more sort of much bigger uh, uh, economics work. So it's a mistake to separate these two things, and it's a mistake in particular, probably a worse mistake, to start saying his economics is the, 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 the weaker element, the bit you can put to one side, you don't really need to take it seriously. Now Francis Wheaton was writing bluntly before 2008, where, you know, right up until that, around about 2007, 2008, you could go to any of the universities around here, uh, you could wander into any of the bookshops, and you'd be hard pushed to find uh, any marks being taught at all or sold as an economist or that his theory was taken anyway, so it was just dismissed out of hand. It was just like, I mean, literally, this is what people would say when being taught this that, you know, essentially bourgeois economics, mainstream economics had solved, literally, the Nobel Prize winning economics said this in 2006, and it was Robert Lucas that had solved all the major problems of the global economy, he says in 2006, right? This is kind of the hubris, it's, it's quite a When people start saying things like this, you just sort of always look at your watch and wait for something to like, collapse around about that point. You know something's going to hit the fan uh, around about then. And that's 
before 2008. After 2008, suddenly Marx is taken seriously again. But there's also this other variant on it, which is again, it's our separation. Here is the economics over here, here's politics over there. The two things you have to take together. Marx always took it together, he was always a political activist. He was never someone who just sat in the British, he did spend a lot of time sitting in the British Library, uh, writing you know, copious, copious uh, amounts. But he was always a political activist as well. And one of the things you see in his life is that he'd go off, do a bit of economic, do a bit of kind of economic research or other bits of research when he was quiet, and then as soon as everything picks up, he'd run off and help set up the first international way. And that kind of, that's the kind of dilemma, a dilemma we all need to face, I suppose, one way or the other. Marx had this too. And that's partly why he didn't actually finish bloody capital. Part for everything else. I mean, it's very, if you get the, the third volume of it, which Engels had to kind of cobble the last two books of Capital together from Marx's rather you know, sort of disorganised notes. And he goes, and it ends in something like this. The, the, and now we turn to consider the issue of the working class and the ruling class. And Engels has a little note, but here the manuscript ends. It's <laughs> hanging, like a sort of awful cliffhanger where he has finished the, the bloody thing, which of course set up an entire cottage industry of sort of Marxology uh, ever since. So, what does he say? The thing is, three things to get at. This. He gave the manifesto. It's all in the first chapter, really, that you know, he's talking about. It, it's a very condensed version of this theory of history and society and the economy, all in one place, in the first kind of section of the Communist Manifesto, where he's very clear, I think, about three things, basically, four things, actually, three elements, which gives you the fourth element. The first one is that capitalism is a system based on exploitation. This isn't just a kind of moral question. You know, we say someone's exploited, you think, uh, this is a moral issue. It's like if you're exploiting someone, you think that's just a bad situation. It's that people usually use the word. You think if you're exploiting someone, if you pay them like 10 p an hour, they're exploited. Right? And you can see that. And there's a moral uh, content to it. It isn't quite what Marx means. Marx is quite explicit about this. His theory of, well, all hitherto existing society is a history of class struggle. The point here is that we have a capacity to produce as humanity. We can make things, we can work together, we can change how the world is. We can collaborate and produce everything that we see around us. And not just produce what we need, we can produce for the future as well. We can create projects that will last for a long period of time. We can create service. We can produce more than we actually need to consume right now. And we can work out what to do with it. And the struggle throughout history is basically over who gets our surplus, who produces it, and who gets to dispose of it. There's always something extra that we produce. We can produce more than we need. And that what you find in human history, this is Marx's theory of history, there is Throughout the rest of human history, as soon as it's possible to produce a surplus, you get a struggle over the surplus, and you get a small group of people who command that surplus. And that's what you get in ancient societies, in slave uh, holding societies, that's what you get in kind of the Middle Ages, medieval societies, feudal societies, and that's what you get under capitalism. That you have a small group of people who command how that surplus is produced. And we call that today profit. Or we call the people who command that capitalists. Right? And that's capitalism. And that's how the thing uh, operates. But they produce that surplus not because they're so, you know, wonderfully clever and it just comes out of their brains. They produce that surplus in a process which involves exploiting, necessarily exploiting everyone else. That we all get employed by the people who have the power and the capacity to employ us. They own the means of production. They own the offices, the factories, the workplaces. They have all this. They have all that power. We have to work for them. We work under their conditions. We work to their rules. And by doing so, we produce for them a surplus. And they pay a bit on the side, but they produce a surplus. And that surplus comes out of exploitation. So it's an exploitative system, like every other class uh, society in history. It's necessarily based on exploitation. This isn't really a moral thing. It's a description of how society operates. So that's the first bit. The second bit is this notion that you get onto capitalism in particular, and Marx and Engels in the Manifesto are very, very clear about this, that you have the idea of what he later comes to call commodity fetishism. The idea that once you have a society in which money dominates, in which money can be used to buy essentially anything, which any kind of relationship you have, any product that exists, any relationship that exists, can be converted to money. And in particular, of course, the relationship by which you are paid to go and work. I mean, that's the fundamental one here. That once you have a society in which everything can be treated uh, as if it's a commodity, as if it's something to be bought and sold, this creates a kind of fantastical world where all existing relationships that people have, everything that people understand about the world, is potentially thrown open and dissolved and collapses into this market. This is commodity fetishism, this is alienation. This is when he talks about you know, all that is holy is profane, all that is solid melts into air. That once you have a market, once everything can come with a price tag attached, all other relationships can disappear. Everything suddenly is a commodity, and everything can be part of this world. So this is commodity, this centrality of money, 
the critical role of money in a society like this and alienation. So it's exploitative and we're alienated and money commands everything. And the final one, of course, and this is the bit where it unsettling, is if you just go and read the manifesto, it's a bit like, well, this is weird because he's spending quite a long period of time praising capitalism, as Kate said. Really quite a long period of time going through this dynamic system, it's revolutionised how we all live, it's creating wonderful new machines, it's given us all these opportunities. But capitalism is an intensely dynamic system, a dynamic system in human history. You, know, you think of what the Industrial Revolution is, what, 200 and a bit years ago. You think about the way the entire world has changed in that relatively short space of time. I mean, humans have been around for what? Modern humanity has been around for about a million years or thereabouts, when the first modern humans appeared. We've had civilization in one form or another for about 10,000 years. Capitalism has been here for about 200 years, industrial capitalism. And you think of everything that's happened in that relatively short space of time, you measure a million years, even 10,000 years, it's fantastically dynamic. It's, it's incredible the range of possibilities that this has opened up. And the dynamism is not one that we control. And this is another central to his argument. This comes out of the problem of society based exploitation of money. It's not one that we control, it's not one that we set, we don't plan, we don't decide what's going to get invented, who's going to get the money to research things, who's going to go out and invent new products. We don't collectively decide that. It's decided by this completely mad, anarchic process of competition. And that this capitalist class is not sitting there like a big conspiracy commanding all of us. They fight amongst themselves. They're a band of warring brothers, in Marx's phrase elsewhere. They're a band of warring brothers. They fight amongst themselves in the desperate drive to try and get one over every other capitalist. This is how it works. They must be dynamic, they have to invent things, they have to introduce new machinery, they have to create new products, they have to promote growth, they have to do all these things because they're locked in this desperate competition in an unplanned, market-driven, exploitative system. You have to get this dynamic. Now put all that together, and although Marx doesn't develop this in the manifesto particularly, he does in his later work, put all that together, and what you have is a recipe of course for crisis. That if you take all of these elements, there is almost no way at all that a system built in these things can avoid tripping over itself at some point in the future. It has to happen. It was based on exploitation, it's based on a few people making the money out of everybody else who works. That's basically the setup here. And that's not a democratic process, that's just them deciding. If it's based on money, if it's based on everything having a price, if it's based on competition, then everybody's competing, or these all the capitalists are competing amongst themselves, so it's chaos, it's anarchy you're going to have to get crises at one form or another, because it's not planned in any sense. It's not like who's going to sit there and go, OK, in the future, we're going to try and make this happen, and we'll organise production so that, for example, as a car manufacturer, you know how many cars you want to produce in the future. Well, that's not what happens. As a car manufacturer, you produce, you plan for the future, but then everybody else who's making cars plans for the future, and you compete. And you can easily, and this happened in 2008, 2009, you ended up with a massive surplus of cars, far too many cars being produced relative to the amount of money people had and the number of people who buy them. Massive overproduction. Because of this competitive dynamic, competitive process in a market society, you can't plan, you can't organise, you're going to overproduce, you're going to overinvest, and once all the capitalists who are overproduced and overinvested and competed and tried to introduce new inventions, and they've done all of this and they try and sell their stuff and they can't sell it, that's your crisis. That's the way the thing collapses. That's how the whole uh, system can come, uh, trumbling, come, can come tumbling down. Those are the bits that come together. So the key parts here for the crisis really is, first of all, there's a system with money. Uh, everything get, can get reduced to money and to a price, and money dominates everything one way or the other. Second is this dynamism. So you put those, these, these, those two things together in this unplanned system, that's in our line, Marx's theory of crisis one way or the other. The, the drive to try and chase profits, pushes the system into crisis of necessity. And of course, what do capitalists do about it? Well, this is the, the neat irony about this. What are the two ways out of the crisis? Well, they're either money or dynamism that you need to use if you're trying to resolve the crisis on capitalist terms, one or other of these two things, to try and get the system moving again. The dynamism part is the kind of traditional solution to capitalist crisis. The dynamism here is uh, Joseph Schumpeter, you know, very, um, Eminent kind of mainstream, not really mainstream, but very sort of pro capitalist economists uh, who call this creative destruction. Right? So you get all of this crisis too many cars being produced, or whatever it might be, too many ships being sailed. That's one of the things that happened in 2000, 2009 as well. Too much being produced, and quite extraordinary situation if you think about it, but too much is being produced relative to people being able to buy it. Schubert's theory 
And Marx's reason in this, in a certain sense, was that, well, you just close down a load of factories. You make a load of people redundant. You destroy capital. You wipe out loads of wealth. And then once you've done that, once you kind of reset everything back to the point where only the most efficient producers are left, the market has been shrunk to the size that uh, would match the scale of production. Once you've done all that, capitalism can start moving again. So you can wipe out capital. You destroy capital. That recovers the dynamic. That's a dynamism solution to it. The one that we've started seeing recently, and the one that's emerged in response to 2008-2009, is the other form of the solution, the capitalist solution to the crisis, is that you use money instead. That you can pump a system full of money, you can just create loads and loads of money, on a vast scale, and then that can kind of gloss over some of the bigger problems. If you just give people more money, and they can at least for a little bit go out and buy your cars. You know, that's kind of the theory here. And if you look what's happened since 2008, this is what we call quantitative easing, and this has been used as one of the solutions to the crisis on a huge scale. You get your central bank, your bank that looks after all the other banks in any given country, and they produce loads of money, and you pump it into the system, and you hope that resolves the crisis. And the issue you're up against, and this really is why we're running into a fresh round of crisis here, the issue you're up against is that having flooded the system with money, having given this gloss of dynamism to the whole thing, having created a situation in which the crisis looks like it's been resolved because you've created all this money, you've used that capacity in capitalism to give people money, in particular to give wealthy people uh, money, that you haven't actually resolved the underlying problems here. You haven't resolved the issue of massive amounts of investment, excessive investment relative to the size of the market that you're trying to sell to. And if you look, for instance, what's happened in China, and this, by the way, is an extraordinary thing, this is where you start thinking the alarm bells are ringing in capitalism, that this money printing process, quantitative easing, which America has done on a huge scale, uh, China has done versions of this, versions of this money creation process since 2008. That's why the Chinese economy kind of sailed through, one of the reasons it sailed through uh, 2008, that this money is being used either directly, which is what the Chinese government is currently doing, or indirectly, which is what's happening in America, simply buy up shares. So you go to the stock market with this new money, buy up shares, talk about the share price, it all feels better, until we all realise all that's really happening is you're just pumping money into the, the stock market, there's nothing behind this. And that's the kind of crisis that's emerging here. If you take what's happening in China, this massive investment, this extraordinary boom, you know, 10% growth every year for decades, this extraordinary boom that's now running out, has expanded the economy so much, has seen this incredible expansion of things like construction, uh, property, you know, huge ghost cities being built, entire towns and cities developed with nobody moving into them because they can't afford to buy their houses so there. That's kind of a problem. That's the overinvestment. That's where the crisis starts to appear again. So every time you try and come up with a solution, a kind of pro-capitalist solution, a solution that works for system to crisis, you end up just pushing a problem away so it reappears later. This is the hot dog little spectre of the thing comes back to haunt you. You kind of push it in one direction. You say, okay, we printed a load of money, so we don't have to go through the messy process of closing down loads of businesses and making mass redundancies. We're just doing a money printing thing. And that kind of works for me until everyone starts saying, well, all you've done is just printed a load of money. I don't trust your money anymore. The stock market is collapsing. The property bubble is collapsing. There's massive overinvestment. The entire economy is going down. Pan. That's when the crisis reappears. And that is where I think the final part of the manifesto is, is important and why you can't separate Marx's economic theory from his politics. And this does relate to the question of determinism. Is all of this inevitable? Well, crises are pretty much inevitable. In the credit system is going to produce crises in one form or another. You can't really say how and when necessarily. That takes a bit more work to get to that point. We can say crises are going to happen. What isn't inevitable is how those crises are resolved. Are they resolved in favour of the ruling class, in favour of the capitalists, or are they resolved in, in favour of everyone else? And that's the question that the Communist Manifesto poses starkly. Ultimately, this is a question about the survival of capitalism itself. That either, uh, as Marx says, either you're looking at the revolutionary constitution of society at large, or the common ruin of the contending classes. That either we will overcome this crisis ridden exploitative system and build something quite new, or that system will lurch into more and more and worse crises, now engulfing the entire natural environment of the planet, and they will push us into uh, a common ruin of the contending classes, or as Rosa Luxemburg more pithily put it, the choices that we have are either socialism, that we build something new and different and better than this, 
or barbarism, that we don't do that, and that everything collapses, and this huge dynamic exploitative system consumes the very basis of civilization itself. And if you look at what's happening with climate change, you can start to see uh, elements of that coming in very directly. But that's a subjective political choice. That's a political project. That isn't inevitable. You're not guaranteed to get one or the other. When you get one or the other, it depends on how you organize, the ideas that you fight for, and when you convince millions of people, ultimately, that a different and better world is possible. I'll finish now. Anderson covers every part of the globe. I mean, when Marx is writing, this process was by no means complete. It's barely begun. You know, this is the creation, the steady creation of the world market. It takes place over many hundreds of years before you get industrial capitalism. But it's certainly not by this point. It's something that covers the entire globe. It's not even clear that this this strange new system of factory production, the rest of it, would necessarily survive. And you could easily sit in 1848, or we could see the strikes in Manchester in 1842 and when Engels arrives there to do his research for the um, conditions of the English working class, uh, his first sort of work of sociology about how workers lived, you know, he was going to take that to Germany and sort of describe what was happening in England, you could easily think that perhaps his system was just going to collapse hugely right there and then. And it's a stabilisation of it that it's not quite there in the Communist Manifesto, but it's agreed to which when he talks about globalisation or early form of globalisation, stabilisation of capitalism, that the expansion of the market provides, you can see it's kind of there as well, because this is what happens. That capitalism does stabilise after its very chaotic mm -hmm. years, up to 1848, it stabilises. Mm -hmm. uh, and you get within that, uh, I call it deliberate, but there is this process by which the working class itself is accommodated into the system, or at least parts of it are deliberately, effectively deliberately, uh, I think quite intentionally, can take Britain accommodated into the system and take it on board and no longer they're going to be these, this revolutionary, this you know, insurgent class that will overthrow everything, but in practice you can have chunks of it that think, well, they can get a better deal out of the system, and they do start to get a better deal out of the system. And this is when you get the reappearance, certainly in Britain, but really happens across the rest of Western Europe, of, of family values, so the, you know, the nuclear family as the ideal family unit, and this sudden drive to get women out of workplaces again, or place them in subordinate positions if they are in a workplace. That's sort of, so all of this happens after he writes the manifesto, it's part of the stabilisation of capitalism, but the stabilisation is on very, very rickety basis, because the tendencies to crisis are always there, and I think Richard's absolutely right, that Marx doesn't get into the issue of the state directly in the manifesto, nor does he, it's one of the other things he was supposed to write, where if he, you know, rather selfishly died before finishing Capital, he would have written a book on the role of the state, which by the way would seem an awful lot of hassle, I suspect, one way or the other, uh, further down the line. But he was going right on the role of the state, he doesn't really get into it, it's left to later people, and in particular Bukhari, uh, Russian Marxist, writing in, well, around the First World War and just after, on the way in which competition between capitalists, between firms, can start to integrate into their states, because you as a big company, you look to your state to look after your interests. You're a big firm. The state is there to kind of look after you first of all. What's good for General Motors is good for America, right? It's a clear statement of the thing. Your state on your side, and that can advance into, if you're a state, you have guns, and you have you know, warships, and you have bombers. That can turn into competition between states fairly directly. And even before you get to the point of actual shooting war, you can see all the tensions that appear inside capitalism, when in particular when it's in crisis. The period after 2008 is, is indicative of this, and, and I'll come on to the, the point about quantitative easing on, on this one, which is the way in which, and people have probably picked up on this, the way in which states have been attempting to defend their own capitalist interests through this process of competitively devaluing their own currency. This is the currency wars that was, you know, quite a fuss was made about a couple of years back, it died down a bit, and it suddenly started to reappear with the sudden devaluation uh, of the Chinese currency in, in a couple of weeks ago. The idea here is that you undercut all the other capitalists out there by just making your currency worthless, one way or the other. And if you do that, you can steal their market. Now the problem there is if you're trying to steal their market, they'll just turn around and do the same thing. And everybody starts doing this, and this is the currency war, competitive devaluation. This is what happens in the 1930s. This is how you end up with the breakdown of the international monetary system in the 1930s. Basically, everyone tries to devalue against everyone else, all trying to steal markets. This is the state defending the interests of capital, right? 
And this, by the way, well, look at the 1930s, it doesn't take that much to get from this kind of economic competition into military competition. You can see how the thing shifts comparatively easily. And if you start to see some of the tensions that are building up around East Asia, you know, with the dispute between China and Vietnam over the South China Seas, and China and America around uh, Taiwan, this is turning you know, this business about building new islands on reefs that you then claim as your country and never gets there first can build a military base on it. I mean, it's kind of comic in a certain sense. You've got, you, know, you see pictures of all these kind of Philippine soldiers like just standing there up to their waist saying, this is our like, <laughs> reef, was like Chinese warships over there. But it's, it's comic, but it's also like deadly serious, because it is. This is like where the clashes start to appear. That's where globalisation breaks down. That's where all the rigmarole of like, we've just created this wonderful world market, there'll be no more wars, no more fighting. Winkowski, the uh, Pope of Marxism, as he was called at the time, writing just before, he's literally 1913 or early 1914, when he says, capitalism's so developed, the world market's so big, we can't possibly have any wars, it'll be too expensive for everybody, right? Months before the food. It's that thing about, as soon as people say this, right, look at your watch, you know, just keep an eye out for something terrible about to happen as soon as people start around this sort of stuff. So that's the dynamic between the state uh, and capital there. Now, just on the people's quantitative easing um, quickly. All right, look, quantitative easing, basically, this, the way this works is that if you have a central bank, and everybody does have a central bank, if you've got your own currency, central bank is the bank that looks after all the other banks. This is worth bearing in mind when you're talking about the central bank. It's a bank's first aim in life is to look after banks. Everything else is kind of secondary to that, and it's worth bearing that in mind if anyone has any nice ideas about the Bank of England is really on our side. It's not. It's the bank side. Right. What you can get your central bank to do, in the way that all the other banks can do this, this is how banks work, you can get it to just create new money. So you can go to the Bank of England and go, uh, can you just create, in case of Britain, £375 billion, please? And then you go, okay, and then you go and create new money, it's electronic, because so you just credit it in the account. They use this money in Britain, this is how quantity easing has worked here. You then go off to private banks and insurance companies and big financial institutions and go, here's all this lovely new money for you. We're going to buy from you government debt, so you buy back a load of government debt. The aim of this is to just pump a load of money into the system. The theory was that once you give a load of money to banks, they'll go out and lend to like lots of useful things like small businesses, whatever. Small business lending has fallen uh, every single year since that, 2009, so that hasn't happened. What's actually happened is that all these institutions have got this money and gone, oh, we've got all this cash, we need to find something that produces a nice big return that's very safe. What does that mean? London property. So what they've done is gone and bought those kinds of property in London, effectively. This is what's happened here. So one of the reasons house prices, one of the reasons it's insanity <coughs> that you can see right around the city just building, building, building luxury flats, it's a result of quantity easing. Mm -hmm. It's the way so the money's going to inhabit. Yeah, the money's coming to the economy like this. What people's quantity easing says is, look, this is, this is kind of daft. We've created £375 billion. Pounds. We've basically given it to a load of rich people to make them richer. That's the process. The Bank of England says this in its own assessment. It says we just made a lot of rich people rich. All the money's going to make the property prices go up. Who gets better off if that happens? People who own lots of property, right? So that's what's happened. So the people's quantitative easing is the idea you use the same money creation process, but instead of spending it ultimately on expensive London flats, you say, why don't we invest it in railways? Why don't we use it to build hospitals? Why don't we use this capacity in a, in a, different, in a different way? <coughs> now, this is provoked jumping up and down and shouting hysterics. Uh, from certain quarters. This is Jeremy Corbyn's plan, headline in the Telegraph yesterday. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn wants to turn us into Zimbabwe, which is a bit. We in the manifesto, but it's like the well, weather being right, but possibly the rest of the not so good. It's this great fear that if you start printing money like this, you'll provoke massive inflation elsewhere. It will start paying on about 1920s in Germany, hyperinflation, this sort of thing. Most of these things are overstated. We've already printed a load of money, we haven't got massive inflation, we've got very, very low inflation, possibly deflation. Probably people's quantity easing you could use for a limited period of time, at least, as a relatively effective way to get money into the economy that would actually work to the benefit of people. The Bank of England, the banking system, is not happy about this because it starts to challenge their own right to decide how the money system operates. That's the kind of fundamentals of it. They want to keep tight control over the whole process because they want to be the people who are in charge of the money system, in charge of how banks work. As soon as you start saying, why don't we just spend this money elsewhere, it's a challenge to that authority, and that's really what the, the jumping and shouting is all about. Does that help you? Yeah, I guess yeah. that doesn't explain myself very well. What I was trying to get across was you were talking about these as um, the, these like pro capitalist ways of resolving crisis. Yeah. I, was, I guess I was looking at people's queuing and that. 
context, what does it actually do for resolving the underlying problems? Anything or not? It's what, sorry, it, does it do anything for resolving underlying problems? Well, it depends. Like, it, to the extent that it is a challenge to the authority of the Bank of England and our banking system in general to just do whatever the hell it likes, it is a, mm. it is a kind of anti capitalist step. Because right? you're basically saying, we're not going to, this is the other bit that everyone gets very excited about, we're not going to have this independent Bank of England anymore, we're going to tell it what to do. Mm. What it's going to do is stuff for the benefit of most people, not stuff for the benefit of a few people. And that also is something that's really, I think everybody is very, very unhappy about this. It's, it, they're unhappy because it's a challenge to their authority. Right. But it's not. It's not something that will actually be hyperinflation. Let's say. Any other questions? Quite a lot there. Uh, really. So yeah, look, Greek. I'll start with the Greek thing because there's a huge influence on, on Marx. Aristotle is an absolutely enormous influence on, on what Marx is doing. Uh, and if you read, it's quite striking. If you go and pick up um, Aristotle's it's, it's politics, isn't it? Where he talks yeah. So it's Aristotle's politics, he talks about economic processes, and he makes a very clear distinction to uh, the economic, yeah, which is the, yes. the, the bit of the economy that's kind of good. It's a bit where you live in and where we consume and work, and it's kind of worthwhile. And then this crematistic thing, which is like the sort of money spinning. You know, it has this description of money spinning as a translation that's used sometimes, where it's just like betting and gambling and like you know, finance and all that sort of stuff. Very, very clear distinction, which Marx picks up on, I think, uh, quite, quite you know, dramatically in there. The other bit he picks up, of course, is this within Aristotle, the, the idea of a, the issue of the totality, of the totality of relationships, which is quite central to, to how he describes the economy. You don't have an economy as a collection of individuals. You have an economy which gives individuals the ability to work and operate. It's that way around, I think. It's quite important to be clear about that when, when dealing with the economy in general, and Marx in particular. Uh, I mean, this, this does get into, without going too much tangent, it relates to the past dominating the present and that sort of thing, which is the John Bellamy Foster writing about Epicurus as the roots of Marx's thought, which I mean, whilst it's a whilst read his books, so I probably couldn't do justice to the argument. I always thought it was a bit flawed. Epicurus is the philosopher of like, you know, if you talk about someone being Epicurean, there's somebody who's pleasure seeking, it's all they really want. Epicurus is somebody who says, you know, it's a bit crude, my crude version of it is you look after yourself and it's utilitarian. And it's the basis for kind of bourgeois economics. Well, it's just an yeah. 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 Exactly. So everybody's an isolated individual and you look after that. And that just seems really contrary to what sure. Marx is trying to say. Sure. The issue there, I think, is that the other bit to pick out, and it sometimes gets forgotten about, because it's not particularly in the Communist Manifesto, is that Marx does have a, a, an idea about ecological issues which he comes back to again and again and again, mm. that he does say, and he's quite explicit about this, and, you know, Marx is often represented as saying that all value, all wealth that there is, is a product of us working. And if you, it's very much later in his life, the critique of the Gotha programme, which is the original programme for the first unified German Workers' Party, uh, with Marx scribbling his notes on quite aggressively, like, and this has been handed down to a strong man. And they got a line in it where it says that labour is the, the source of all wealth. It's like rubbish. Labour and nature is a source of all wealth, right? It's the fact that we have this whole planet with all its values that are there, and we work on it. This nature exists. It's not an ideal thing. It's not an idea. It's not in our heads that we produce value. It's because there's a material existence. And that, I think, is quite a, a very important insight when you're dealing with something like the ecological crisis that we're now in, for instance. You have to have an understanding that Marx isn't just the present will dominate the past, or the past will dominate the present. I mean, that is a description, by the way, of climate change. That is the past dominating the present. The fact that we've been burning fossil fuels for so long is the disaster that's now coming down. It's quite dramatically, I think. And the way around it is, will involve getting out of capitalism one way or another and approaching the problem of climate change and the environment collectively. There's no other way, obviously no other way to solve it. It's just isn't a thing that can be done. Um, the other bit I want to pick up on quickly was the, the, the John uh, absolutely right about you can have a small crisis and there's kind of automatic mechanisms to resolve it. You can have a small recession. There was a relatively small recession in the 1990s. And it didn't involve a massive political crisis to resolve the thing. It wasn't necessary to do that. Now, 2007, 2008, the crash there is a catastrophically large crisis, which is basically held off by the state here and a few other states through a combination of Keynesians, and they just spend a load of money. Uh, this is where the deficit and the debt comes from. This is where all that fuss comes from. And they print a load of money and they bail out the banks. Total cost bailing out the banks about 1.2 trillion uh, pounds in this country. It's hugely expensive. They do all of this to try and avoid what they actually need to do, which is have an almighty great political crisis and completely change how the entire system operates. 
They don't do that, and they've got an immense amount of effort in trying to hold this thing back. But it's a little bit like commutes, I think, at this point. The amount of effort you put in on a prop system up here then turns into a different form of political crisis down the line. Because then you have to deal with the whacking great deficit that you've got, and the debt, and the quantity of easing, the huge amounts of money out there. And this is what's happening in China, and this is partly what's happening around the arguments around austerity in this country. It's this crisis that you try to hold off, this political crisis you tried to avoid in 2008, it's coming back and it's creeping up on us. And it's going to turn into an economic crisis, which will be an enormous uh, political crisis here. And this is, you know, it's, it's easy to, to kind of gloss over this once you start talking about the economy, because it all kind of looks automatic and it's lots of equations and everything sort of adds up and it goes around in circles and it's all like a nice little model. The politics is what determines it in the end. And Trotsky was very, very clear about this in, in writing the 1920s and 30s, dealing with theories of capitalism, just saying it's long waves, things go up, things go down, it's just you know, kind of automatic. And so, no, there's got to be a political crisis. Ultimately, you get something so dramatic, the automatic mechanisms in capitalism for dealing with the crisis don't work, so you have to have a great big political hoo-ha to sort the thing out. I mean, picking up um, Paul Mason's post-capitalism, which I think is worth a read, and it's quite, it's, it's interesting, it's quite flawed, and probably the biggest single flaw is precisely that he ends up talking about this advance out of capitalism as a kind of automatic process. It'll be technology that does it. We don't need a political crisis to do this. The state isn't really there. We'll just kind of have peer-to-peer -peer lending and you know, use the internet a bit more. And um, that will kind of, you know, that's a bit of a fair parody, really. But that's, that's roughly where it's coming from. So you get a very technologically determinist argument. Because we have technology, we don't need a political crisis. It'll resolve everything for us. It's a complete mistake. Because we have technology, we very obviously need a political crisis. Because the, the technology is being used by politics, it's being used by the state. You look at the relationship between, say, Google, and the US state, right? If that, that is something that's poisonous, and it's only going to be a political crisis that resolves it. it has to be. I mean, if we don't resolve it, it just gets more and more poisonous, and the whole thing builds up and builds up. So they're always, it comes back to politics, 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 always. So if you talk about an economic crisis, any economic crisis at all, has embedded in it a political crisis, one form or another. And if it's a deep economic crisis, that political crisis will appear. And that thing is, is basically what we're getting into now, with the issue of Jeremy Corbyn in this country, the ensuing uh, Chinese uh, economic collapse and, and God knows what's going to happen next year. So, uh, blue and June. <laughs> we probably have time for a couple more contributions, so Faith. It was just this I mean, it's just in it's been in man for five years really, I'm just <laughs> point, like thinking fuck it. Look, the opinion polls have been incredibly consistent on this. Right? For whatever difference we may or may not have made. It looks like maybe it's shifted now, and I'll come back to that. The opinion polls consistently basically found a third of people who think austerity is unfair and not needed. A third of people who think it's basically fair and necessary. Mm. And there's a third of people who have the in-between position and think it's unfair, but you have to do it. Right? And that has been consistent for about five years. Everybody's just sat here dump, 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 and not really moved. The bit that's starting to shift, I think, is one, we've got better organised on our side, and that's starting to pull the, the argument a bit in our direction. It's one part of it. The other bit is, is the FT has been keeping a bit of an eye on this one. We start asking people about, what do you think about the austerity we've done? They are, oh, well, you know, we have to do it. Yeah, I agree, right, fine. If you go, what about the austerity coming up? They start saying things like, oh no, no, we don't need to, you know, the economy's growing again, we don't need to do it, right? I mean, this is not something we should support. Now, the difficulty here, this is where I start to think, well, to be honest with you, we should just carry on banging on about, we don't need to do austerity, this is a smashing grab operation, we need to start saying this is about rich people taking stuff from the rest of us. That's what's going on. You know, never mind the deficits, just the excuse, I think, you know, so that's what's going on here. But what the government have lined up over the next few years is an accelerating rate of austerity, much more austerity than we've had mm. in the last year. I mean, they've actually stopped doing austerity, coincidentally enough, in the year before the election. You know, this is not coincidentally, yeah. obviously. Mm. So, and then they kind of, they've got this acceler accelerating rate ahead, mm. which is going to have a huge impact. I mean, what's the estimate from the Institute of Fiscal Studies? 13 million people losing an average of 280 pounds a year, right? Three million people losing a thousand pounds a year. Those three million people are from the bottom 20% of the population, right? This is going to have an extraordinary impact. And that's exactly the point which someone's going, oh, well, we've done austerity, we don't need to do it anymore. So I think we're going to hit a, a great bit of political crisis around this, regardless of whatever else might be happening at that point. And that's even before the sudden potential of a fresh round of real economic crisis turns up, and you throw in uh, Jeremy Corbyn and everything that's happened around his campaign. You know, line all this up, and this is an extremely unstable uh, next few years that we're looking at. You know, things are going to look very different in five years' time, would be my uh, not very helpful uh, prediction on that score. <laughs> Just on, on Claire's thing, 
The, so basically to deal with your question, I'd say, look, it's one of those, well, I don't think you're going to budge people. You can go all around the houses with some Keynesian in argument about it, and I just don't think it works. Then you just have to save people. Also, this, this is about class politics. This is like a bunch of rich people. Rich people. We know who they are. They're in government, and they're grabbing things and selling it off to their mates, literally. That's what happened with RBS. It's what's happened with anything else that can lay their hands on. That's what it's all about. Yeah, the NHS. It's a smashing ram operation. I'll just say that. I mean, we should stick to saying that. So I think that's probably the argument that works. Claire, on, sorry. Can I just ask a question yeah. related to that? So, if you're having a conversation with someone who's saying you've got to bring down the deficit, mm. what's the answer to that? The answer why, to why do we not? Well, the, the answer to that is, you can, you can go around this several ways. I mean, I think the, the, because it's such a deeply entrenched idea, and you can see why it's happening. You've had seven years of people going, you have debt, you should repair debt. And everyone thinks, well, yeah, you have debt, you should repair debt. That's probably a good thing to do. You know, particularly if you do have debts yourself, you know, really want to, and they go, oh, the whole country's got a debt, I can repair. But the, probably some of the ways around that are, firstly, we tried repaying the uh, debt and the deficit. The debt under the last government rose by 517 billion pounds. So we're doing all this austerity and the debt is still rising. By the way, 517 billion pounds is, is not just more money than the last Labour government borrowed, it's more money than every single Labour government in history added together and borrowed, right? It's a huge sum. So the, the, this whole austerity thing isn't working. We're not paying off the debt. So if it's not working, don't do it. That's probably one of the easier arguments to, to go into. I think that'll probably help. Yeah. I mean, you can start to get into like, yeah. The whole economy isn't like a household, but it just feels to me like, uh, anyway, so if I had a really good answer to this, I'd probably come up with it already and we'd all be in a better place, but you know, I don't know anybody has said it. Yeah. Sorry, Jane, it isn't the debt actually, because it's in trillions now, mm. unpayable, and, but, but what we have is this growing problem of trade imbalance, yeah. and that, that is the sort of debt that they're not, you know, that's what they're not, they can't deal with, and they're not dealing with. And, and, you know, the, the public are largely unaware of this. I, it's, it's very, very complicated, it's not that it's for them. It's, it's, made complicated. it's been made more complicated than it needs to be. I think, yeah. I think you're sort of right. Look, the other bit is that the government debt isn't actually the big problem here. No. If you're talking about a debt crisis in this country, the crisis is the fact that we have the most heavily indebted households in the developed world. And because of austerity, those households are now borrowing more and more and more. Right? So everybody's borrowing. So alright, it's all very well for the government to say they're cutting their borrowing. Everybody else is going to borrow time for the same. Right? That's how we got a crash last time. Oh, right. like, none of this makes any sense. This, yeah. uh, wait, no, oh. no. No. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take my job. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, Jack, and Orlando will have questions. The biggest boom in, in, in say, it's not going to happen in the developed world. If you look at what's happened in China over the last 30 years, let's say, or East Asia for that matter, it's, it's not looking elsewhere. You can see big booms happen, there's dynamism sort to of it. But in the developed world, you get a boom that's not just a boom for capitalists, people at the top, it's a boom for everyone. I mean, this is the most rapid rise in most people's living standards ever, you know, since the industrial age at any point in human history. Mm -hmm. This is an extraordinary advance. And most of what we think and appreciate uh, in our society, like these big social institutions like the NHS, like free education, this comes out of that boom. You know, yeah. this is the product of that boom, and it's a product of a strong working class at the time, organised working class, and it's a product of a strong social democracy, which in booming capitalism can win something. You know, the good thing about boom, the good thing about uh, capitalism expanding rapidly like this, is that if you have two sides that are competing, that's what you've got, workers and capitalists, that's ultimately where the thing falls down into, and they're competing over who gets the pie, and who gets what slice of it, and you just make the pie a bit bigger, you don't have to fight so much, right? You can keep your size kind of roughly the same proportion, but you get more. So if you're growing, when you have growth, you don't have this fight. When capitalism starts to slow down, that's what we've got now. When capitalism starts to slow down, it's, not, it's always a fight. It's a fight even to keep the things you've got. So there's a real pressure. You can see the crisis of social democracy right way across Europe is tied into the wider crisis of capitalism, which does, I think, fit in with the fully rate profit that people have raised. It's kind of, slowing dynamism and capitalism, slow down the rate of growth. Capitalism is not growing as fast now, certainly in this country, it was in the 50s, 60s, or even the 70s. Much faster growth in the 70s and then mm -hmm. all the boom market about it. The, once you have that slowdown in growth, everything becomes a fight all the time. And it's a weak capitalism, and the disadvantage for us is that we're weak within a weak capitalism. That's the situation we're in. So you have a weak Labour Party, you have a weak union movement, and then you have a weak capitalism, and everyone's kind of flailing around in all of this, trying to get something out of that. 
But if capitalism doesn't produce growth, those distributional conflicts become very, very severe. Look what happened in the 20s and 30s. That is a distributional conflict. In the end, it's resolved for capitalism by having a massive great war. That's how the thing plays, plays out. And you can see those distributional conflicts happening here. I mean, it's extraordinary with Corbyn. If you look at his manifesto and what he said so far, this is basically moderate Keynesianism. Mm -hmm. A lot of people banged on about 1983. My guess is that his program is probably a little bit to the right of the SDP's manifesto in 1983. Never mind what the Labour Party. But anyway, if you go and compare, I bet you it's around about you know, that sort of positioning. That's how bad things have got, and that's how much work we have to do to, to try and defend it. Um, and the point about shifting people's uh, minds, I think that's absolutely right. There was, the difficulty of design of austerity is that like, they've set up this trap where we all have to start trying to talk about a bloody deficit. Yeah. And it's just like, I think, I mean, sort of park it and say, no, that's not the real issue here. Which is a difficult thing to do. You have to frame the issue on your terms, which is why the demonstration matters, because you force the issue on your terms, not their terms. And there is a bit of a slippery slope here that, I mean, particularly speaking of self or something, kind of job, but, but it applies more generally. There is a kind of an elite argument against, against austerity. There's a mainstream economist argument against austerity. The, the IMF, right, which is by no means some sort of cabal of trust, it's quite mm -hmm. far from being any such thing, produced a research report about two months ago that basically said, austerity in Britain is a complete waste of time, no need for it. The day isn't that big, you can run it down gradually over a number of years. It's the IMF saying it, you know, it's the research department saying it. You know, the, Paul Krugman, whose blog is worth reading, but he's actually, I mean, he's been radicalised by things, uh, I think, but he's actually quite a right-wing economist. He just, like, he's just sitting there with his textbook model, and the textbook model says, if you're in a session, spend more money. So he's just like, do that, and then he's like, he gets driven half mad by the crazy people all saying, no, no, we're going to cut everything. Because, of course, what lies behind, we're going to cut everything, we're going to do austerity, is the appreciation on their side that this is a political crisis, and we're going to resolve it in our favour and transform how the whole society that we live in operates. That's George Osborne's long term, mm -hmm. not an economic plan really, it's a social plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's what he wants things to look like in, in, in five years' time. Mm -hmm. Just finally on Claire's one, um, on, which was on money and banks creating it and printing it and all that. I mean, yeah, I think it's a very good question because what's, banks are very, very peculiar privileged institution in society in that they're the only institution we have that's legally allowed to create money. I mean, you and I can go and create money as well. Uh, if we make it look like a five-star note, we'll get arrested. And if we just go and call them Claire Pounds or something, we have a hard time persuading anybody that this is actually money that's worth something. I'm sorry, Claire, but... Excuse me. Try, but uh, see how far you get. Try, <laughs> sorry. So anyway, so banks have this privilege, they can create things that all the rest of us use as money, and that's how a bank works. I mean, sometimes people think banks are like a pot of... Did anybody watch DuckTales, Scrooge McDuck, where you had this massive vault that you go and like dive into with gold? Sometimes people think banks are a bit like that, a big pot of gold somewhere. You have some for a loan, you go and have a quick check to see how much gold they've got, and then you hand it over. It's not like that at all. If you ask for a bank for a loan, and they want to give it to you, they just create money. That's literally all that happens here, they have that privilege. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so they, they create money when you ask for a loan. That's the privilege a bank has. What's happened over the last 20, 30 years, this is part of neoliberalism, financialization, all these other big words, is that, yes, is, that um, is that you have this enormous expansion of money in bank accounts, an enormous expansion of borrowing, so that banks are creating electronic money on a massive scale because they're just, particularly during the boom, handing out money to everyone. Because one of the solutions that neoliberalism creates, I mean, it's a way of trying to resolve a crisis in the 70s. You think, how do you restore profitability, crisis mm -hmm. profitability in the 70s? Mm -hmm. yeah. The quick, easiest way to restore profitability, pay workers less, like just cut costs. Mm -hmm. So they do that, but if you pay workers less, nobody has any money to buy anything, so you then give them money to, you loan them money, so they don't buy stuff, and the whole mm -hmm. system keeps ticking up. That happens on a huge scale. Obviously, if you're kind of paying people less but giving them more and more money as borrowing, at some point this is going to come crashing down, which is what happens in 2007, 2008. The amount of paper money there is a tiny, tiny fraction of the total amount of money in circulation by this point. 3%? Sorry? 3%. It's about 3% of money in circulation is notes and coins. Right. All the rest of it is electronic. Mm -hmm. So it's a tiny, tiny part of it. So one of the questions we face, actually, let me wrote uh, this very good. The name of it, a very good uh, pamphlet he wrote where he goes through, what's it called, How to Deal with the Crisis, what's the one, from about 1916 or so, when he goes through, like, we need to take control of the banking system, we need to bring this into some form of democratic control, because if you get this, you can start to get hands off all the other functions in capitalist society. This gives you a very, very powerful lead, and I think he's absolutely right on that, which also helps explain why the people's QE thing is greeted such horror, because it's a bit like we're just going to grab this and use it in a different way.
and that is something that capitalists will really, really not tolerate. I think that's yeah, that's point five. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. Before we have, thank you for that, James. Oh, thank you.